Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Sustainable House Day expert session. We are thrilled to have you. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the stolen nation, stolen lands of many First Nations people. I personally am speaking to you from the lands of the Jaja Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, that this always was, always will be Aboriginal land. If you like, please feel free to share which Aboriginal land you are watching from in our chat. Just want to double check that people can hear me. I see some people in the chat are having a little, uh, some issues with sound. All right, I'm getting mixed opinions. So I'm going to forge on, let me know. So before the webinar begins, we'd like to tell you a little bit about Sustainable House Day and Renew. So Sustainable House Day is a national event that gives you access to some of Australia's most sustainable homes. So this year we are offering up four themed weeks of online and in-person events around the country leading up to Sustainable House Day, which is the 17th of October, when we'll host a day of free online sessions with homeowners. This week is our Sustainable Materials Week brought to you by Your Home, Natters and Design for Place. So thanks for them to making this event possible. You can visit sustainablehouseday.com to see detailed house profiles and tour videos for the 133 homes open this year and to book for our upcoming events. Sustainable House Day is organized by Review, which is a Renew, a not-for-profit that inspires, enables, and advocates for people to live sustainably in their homes and communities. You can find out more about us at renew.org.au. Tonight's session will begin with expert presentations and then move on to a Q&A session. You can ask questions at any point in the webinar this evening using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So please use the Q&A for chats you would like to be addressed by the panelists. And then the chat is more for general discussion with fellow enthusiasts about sustainable evenings. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to our exceedingly well-qualified MC this evening, Andy Marlowe, who is a director at Passive House Design and Construct and Envirotecture, holds both bachelor's and master's degrees in architecture, is a certified Passive House Designer and has extensive experience in sustainable design at a variety of scales. He has led master planning projects, been involved in several successful competitions, including the Bathurst Sustainable Living House, designed Sydney's first certified Passive House and led the materials research for Australia's first certified living building. Andy believes all people should live, work and play in buildings that make them happy and healthy. His, quote, day job focuses on ensuring people with reasonable budgets get into the best home possible through a focus on health, comfort and efficiency in all its meaning. He is also a volunteer director at the Australian Passive House Association. Welcome, Andy. Thank you very much, Maddie. Good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us and taking time out of your Thursday evening. Um, it's lovely for you to have made the time. We're all very excited about the next hour or two that we've got in front of ourselves. Um, as Maddie says, we're going to go through some presentations initially um, and then we're going to go to the Q&A part. So please do let those questions flow in. Um, there'll be a bit of monitoring on the way through um, and we'll definitely come back to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, I wish to begin by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which I am this evening, which is the, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and pay respects to their um, leaders, past, present and emerging. Um, I wish to introduce our first speaker all the way from sunny Western Australia, where I'm led to believe that Perth is the most ecologically minded city in the world, according to our previous discussion. Um, although we're not going to be debating this later. Um, Brian Gwigan is um, from iSmart Building um, Group. He is, as you will tell from his accent, not originally an Australian um, citizen. Um, he's come via New York City and various other places on his journey through life. And he's now found himself in the West and um, where he um, is one of the country's leading builders of um, passive house buildings, certified passive house buildings. And is certainly one of the many people in Perth leading the charge on high performance homes. Um, you will have read his bio, so I will not reread that word for word. Needless to say that Brian is a, um, a very, very knowledgeable and competent builder. I'm um, madly passionate about what he does. And on that note, I will let him talk madly and passionately about windows. 
Um, so as I've been introduced already, I am a certified passive house builder. I am a tradesperson, certified passive house uh, consultant, among other things. But my most important job, in my opinion, is father of four kids and husband to a beautiful wife. Um, I will touch on performance only in Windows today. I was trying to steer away from design and function, um, but I will go through performance as much as I can. Um, I would first like to take a minute to acknowledge the traditional owners as previous guys have on the land on which we have met today. I would also like to clear my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I would like to take a second quickly to, to thank the team at Renew and Sustainable House Day. Uh, it's a mammoth effort that these guys deliver continuously year after year, and it's absolutely fantastic. We had a quick conversation about this prior to us coming on. Um, and personally, I'd like to thank Sophie, who has been instrumental. She helps so many clients. Um, I'll go through in a second. We've got some houses listed, but thank you, Sophie, for all of the efforts you've put in so far. It's been fantastic. Um, so a couple of the houses that we have listed, we have... Uh, I think we've got five listed through our company this year, and then we've got three or four through clients that have um, previously built with us. Um, Suburban Lake House is a certified passive house in Wanneroo, single story, beautiful, kind of hinged on, arch on Irish architecture. Um, the one on the right is Cooper House, which is about an hour south of where we are in Perth, uh, an extremely difficult build thermally. It's also a certified passive house, undercroft garage. It's got a uh, three stop lift, so quite a bit of difficulty there in thermal performance. Anyone that knows anything about passive house, will understand the differences, difficulties associated to that. Um, then we have Joy House on the left, single story house in Metro Perth. Um, quite, a, I wouldn't say an easy build, but a, a very uh, emotional build, I think. The, the site was owned by the client's grandmother. Um, there's a lot of character on the front, which mimic the original design of the house. And then on the right of that, we have Valley Views, very small block on a sustainable um, building estate by Development WA. Um, again, not a certified passive house, but extremely high performance. So feel free to jump on the Sustainable House Day website and have a look at all these. Now, um, I know this is going to sound silly, but what is a window? <laughs> well, it's an opening in a wall or a building for the emission of light and air. We all know that as per not only National Construction Code, but energy efficiency, we need them. Um, but more importantly, as Andy and Michael will go through, there's a lot more to a window than just being an opening in a wall. Um, today, I will do my best to try and explain the energy efficiencies or the efficiencies in performance of windows. Um, windows facilitate the entry of natural light and doors. Um, they serve to keep the house ventilated. Um, as such, windows, um, houses with ample windows will seldom look gloomy or feel stuffy. There is quite a bit of detail in that. So this next slide just shows you the house on the left. Well, we've got a sad face, not a lot of light. They look like they're fixed windows. So we don't know how that would be regarding ventilation, but this is only one side of the house. So while it might not look like the best design in the world, the one on the right looks absolutely fantastic. Huge glazing looking out, but again, there may be problems there because we don't see any shading. We don't know the orientation. So it may be that you cook right inside that glass. But again, when we look at aesthetics, the one on the left doesn't look, architecturally looks okay, but from the inside, it may not look so good. And then when we look at the one on the right, more appealing aesthetically. Now, where do we go for information on windows? So before I go through my presentation, I'm gonna give you just a brief idea of where I get most of the information and where you guys can get it too. So in Passive House, we'll go outside of this, but we're not talking about Passive House today. We're talking about performance in windows. So. I find the yourhome.gov.au, this is a fantastic website. There is ample amount of information when it comes to Windows, huge amount of information. And the second one I use is WERS. Anyone that's into performance knows what WERS is. It's the Window Energy Rating Scheme for Windows. Um, you can get all manner of suppliers, all manner of information. Everything you need to do with Windows is on that website. Okay, so we're gonna explore and focus on performance and glazing. And I'm gonna do that through a series of points, five points. So firstly, we're gonna delve into the U-value. What is the U-value and how is it relevant? We'll then turn on thermal bridging and how is it relevant to windows and thermal bridging for the first time in the NCC, we can actually see it coming in this year or in 2022 next year. So we know everyone in Passive House, like I said, knows what it is, but everyone that's outside Passive House, they will need to familiarize themselves with thermal bridging. It's now coming into the NCC. Then we jump into SHGC or solar heat gain coefficient in Windows, extremely relevant. And I'm sure Andy again and Michael will touch on this more so than me. I will go through the performance of SHGC, but I won't delve into it too much. 
And then noise levels. We'll touch on the acceptable noise levels and how it's measured and where we find that information. Okay, so when we talk about product performance, on the government website, we're told that up to 40% of a home's heat and energy can be lost and 80% of the heat gain comes through our windows. So when we talk about performance in windows, improving the performance or the thermal performance of your windows is huge. It's, it's one of the biggest factors we look at when we talk about increasing energy efficiency in a home. Okay. Okay, what is the U value? So for most of you out there, you'll, you'll know what you'll have I've heard of U values, whether they're important or whether they're not, they are, we all know they are. How do we measure the performance of a window? Through U value. Now, when we talk about U values, we can get bogged down in this and we can get all bent up in all kinds of formulas and stuff like that. And I'm going to try and glance over the top, but we're just giving you a brief outline. Okay. So when we talk about U value performance of a window, we talk about the window itself, but it's not just the window. We have a frame, we have a sash, we have a glazing, we have on, on most windows or double glazed windows, you'll have a spacer, um, and then you'll have an installation. So there's five components. Now there's a lot more, but we, we stick to five. How do we measure that? We measure it in watts. So U value is measured in watts. Basically, um, the formula is, it's the UW of the window. So that's the U value of the window installed by the difference of temperature or delta temperature. And it's average about 15 degrees that you place from, it's climate dependent. Everything we do is climate dependent. And then by the area of the window, and that gives you a value in watts. Okay, now, we're going to try and, or I'm going to try and do a small little, um, I don't know, uh, oh, I don't even know what to call it, I'm stuck, sorry. Um, so it's an example of a good window versus a bad window. So what we do is we'll take the information we just looked at a few minutes ago, our delta difference is 15 degrees. And if we take the average current Australian ratio for windows versus floor area, because that's how most people talk about it on performance, so if your whole house is 235 square meters and your average area is 30%, that gives us 70 square meters of, of glazed area. Now, we can argue this that, oh, my house is bigger and his house is bigger and his house is smaller. Yeah, we can argue that, but we're just talking about averages at the moment so we can get some kind of a reference point for what's good and what's bad, okay? So again, taken from the government's website, these are the averages, the current Australian average, 235 square meters, a 30% window to floor area gives us about 70 square meters of glazed area so we're going to take that number and then we're going to pitch that from a standard aluminium single glazed window which we got from the WERS website and a standard upvc thermally broken frame and double glazed unit that we got off the WERS website now this is not the best performing upvc window it's a it's a good performance but it's not the best okay we're looking at 1.6 these can go down to 0 0.7 0 0.9 1.2 1.3 1.6 is average. That's something you can get in the market without breaking the bank at the moment. Okay, so we're looking at U value of 4.2 for the aluminium window and SHGC of 0.48. Um, we'll touch on SHGC in a bit. And then with the other the UPVC, it's 1.6 versus an SHGC of 0.38. Okay, now let's pitch them into that formula that we looked at a few minutes ago. And I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to give you the result. There's a 75% reduction, right? So that's a we've reduced or basically increased the energy efficiency of the window by 75%. So by taking a standard aluminum window and going to a UPVC thermally broken double glazed window, which is not going to break the bank. Okay. We're not talking about stuff that's imported from, you know, Europe fixed and it comes in a container and you got to put it in. I'm talking about stuff that's manufactured right here in WA that we can get our hands on and it doesn't break the bank. So a 75% reduction. Okay. Now let's pitch that, go back to the website again, and we've got the average Australian home energy consumption. This is taken directly from their website. Heating and cooling is 40% of our energy use in a home annually, okay, 40%. So that's quite a bit. So this is where we can reduce quite a lot of energy. Secondly, we will be looking at hot water, but we're not going to go into that. It's a one unit and then appliances after that. Um, there is a webinar out there that uh, Jeremy has done. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat later and I'll, you guys can have a look at it. Now, if we look at the energy saving, so the 75% that we've saved on energy for the window, it's not just the 75%. So we can't say the 75% of that because we also have walls and floors where we lose energy or we gain heat. 
or lose heat for that matter. So when we pitch it back to the original on the very top for the, from the government website, we save 50% of the home of the heating and cooling energy by just changing our windows. By just changing to, yes, it's not the cheapest window on the market, but it's not the most expensive. Okay, so that's just a, a small comparison to show the general public that, look, a little can mean a lot when we talk about energy efficiency. Okay, now I'll just touch on performance in window frames with relevance to thermal bridging. So for those that don't know what thermal bridging is, it's the transfer of energy from the external environment to the internal environment, effectively. That's what it is. So if you have some portion of the building or a structural element of the building, which is outside, and can then transfer energy from the external to the internal environment and radiate that energy inside, be it cold or hot, whatever that energy is, that's a thermal bridge. So what we wanna do is we wanna break that bridge. So we use thermally broken frames, okay? Any product that allows energy to transfer through is of poor performance or considered of poor performance. So if you look here, this is a, a building in New York City. I don't know, uh, some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not, but if you look at the buildings on the left and the right, there's thermal bridging everywhere, extremely poor performance in windows, extremely poor insulation. If you look at the building in the dead center of the shot, that's a, a high performance building. You've got high performance windows, high performance insulation in the walls. You don't see the leakage. All those areas that are green and red, that is heat escaping from the building, leaking from the building due to poor performance products. Okay, how do we identify a thermally broken window or door frame? So I've put some pictures here, right? Now these pictures, they look, they look good, right? You've got your chambers there, multiple chambers. You've got thermal breaking. On the right-hand side, you'll see your double glaze. You'll see a, a, a clear line of thermal bridging or a thermal break through the middle of the frame. The real way to identify a thermally broken frame is through the U-value and performance. Look for the numbers. When you're talking about windows, look for the numbers. Always go to the WERS website, check up the product, look for the U-value. If you look for the view value, you will find a performance. And that's where the real, that's where you can tell whether a window performs or not. Okay. When we're talking about uh, thermal bridging, we also need to look at the material. What are our windows made from? So I'm, I'm just going to go through some quick samples because I'm aware of time. Um, so what we look at is what is a bad conductor of energy, but a good structural element for the frame itself? Because that's what we want. We, people want large openings. They want to be able to have windows that function and don't fail. So mechanically, they need to function and not fail. So wood, we look at wood, it's a good product. Thermally, very good product. Structurally, also good, but it has its limitations, okay? Can be expensive also. We look at UPVC, again, a better material again, good material thermally. Structurally, not so much. It has to, be, um, it has to have uh, strengthening inside the core of the product. It does have the five um, chambers. So it can have more chambers. It can be thermally broken even better than that, but essentially it has some structural um, holdbacks as well. It's not exactly the best product. It's a good product, not the best product. And then there's a lot of scaremongering in Australia as well about UV, et cetera, et cetera. So I think next is aluminium, bad thermally, very bad thermally. If it's not a thermally broken product, we will not use it under no circumstances. And you'll see that you look at the U values on the product, it will not be good. Okay. Structurally, they are quite good. You can get large openings, you can get all kinds of systems, bifold sliders, stacking sliders, lifting slides, you can get all kinds of systems with aluminium that are good. And have, there's longevity in the product, because aluminium is a strong product. Okay. Thermally, very inefficient. This, for me is gold standard, you're looking at alu clad. Now, there's other windows out there, but Aluclad is just about coming to the market in Australia now where it's, it's still expensive, but it will be something that will come into the market quite heavily in the next 10, 10 odd years. Um, structurally, it's fantastic. It can, you can use a soft wood in the inside or spruce or anything like that as long as it's treated. Um, and for thermal efficiency, it's absolutely fantastic. So when you're looking for, a, if you're looking at the high end of the market and you're looking for a really good product, I would say Aluclad is where you should look. Okay, solar heat gain co coefficient. It's, it's basically the fraction of solar radiation admitted through a window. Effectively, the sun radiates heat. How much of that radiation comes from the sun and gets through your window into the internal environment and heat it up, okay? So there's 
pros and cons to this. And I'm going to let Andy and Michael talk through this because there's a lot in this when it comes to design, orientation, shading, etc. But for the one thing I will do is I'll just explain what it is. SHG is a performance-based measurement. So it's all SHGC is about performance, right? It, it's a number that comes on a unit. They can be 0 0.35, 0 0.42. They're point something. Again, they can be found on the WERS website, but they are dependent on your climate and your design. It's very important that you know that. It, it can be different requirements depending on the design, like I just said, and the approach. So for instance, if you have a passive solar design or you're building a house based on passive solar principles, you may require a higher SHGC, which facilitates more radiation into the building for energy storage. Again, this depends on your climate or your orientation or what you're trying to achieve in the building for efficiencies. Now, if you're building a passive house design, that may flip the opposite way. Again, it depends on your design and your climate, but generally in passive house, you will be looking for a lower SHGC to facilitate less radiation to reduce your energy transfer into the building. Okay, again, but it does depend on your climate. So with SHGC, I'm not gonna get too caught up in it, okay? All right, noise levels in windows. How am I doing for time, Andy? Looking okay? I think I'm about 18 minutes or so. Yeah, you could keep going. Okay, so uh, if you read this section yourself, you'll understand it, it's generally, a poor noise barrier. Windows are generally a poor noise barrier. So for anyone that's out there and they've walked into a house that's of a different type of construction. So be it passive, be it passive solar, but it has double glazed windows. The first thing you will notice is the sound, how quiet it is, how peaceful it is. There's no echoes. That is in itself proof in the pudding. So when we touch on um, sound in windows, how is it measured? It's a sound transmission class or an STC, okay? It's measurement in the reduction of sound. When you're looking at windows, if you're looking at windows for your particular project, if you're beside a train line, you really need to be looking at your windows for sound reduction. You should be, and you should be looking at triple glazed windows. So the STC start in range anywhere from 20 up to 60, okay? The average single glazed aluminum window at the moment is between 18 and 20. Now, if you look at the graph on your screen, you look at the bottom of the screen, normal speech, easy to understand, starts at 25, okay? So we have basically little or no sound attenuation on a standard window, okay? Pretty, pretty much. When we get into double glazed windows, we're at 28 to 32. For your standard UPVC double glazed window, you're about 18 to 32, so it's a good product. You're getting good results with that. If you are considering something that you really need, like if you're next to a busy highway, if you're next to a train line, or if you're next to a, a, a loud source of noise that's constant, you need to look at higher performing windows, preferably triple glazing, maybe an alu clad system. But you do need to look at it. Don't, don't assume, get the data. Always look at the numbers, look at the performance. So if we look at this graph again, really quickly before I go to my last slide. So if we look at loud speech and audible is at 50, okay? Our standard windows are 18 to 20. Now, when we come to the next one and we talk about noise, okay? And we talk about hearing loss. If you're living next to a train line or you're living next to a busy highway, hearing loss begins at an exposure of 85 decibels. And the average conversation is only 60. So we're only 25 above it. And we go back to that graph again, we're not far off. So like loud speech, just audible is at 40. So it's just food for thought um, as you go through. All right, tips. Thicker glass is the first one, 10 mil glazing. Um, that's what most commercial applications use for sound. They go to a thicker glass, not only for sound, but they also use it for um, NCC requirements for strength. Uh, double glazing, again, reduces the higher frequency noises um, and it can reduce your noise level up to 50%, okay? Install windows away from noisy sources. I'm sure that Andy and um, Michael will touch on this. That's again, down to the design. I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, avoid placing windows directly opposite or adjacent neighboring houses, etc. Again, that's design. Seal cracks and gaps around windows to achieve better sound reduction. So that's for the current housing stock. 
if you are looking at refurbishing your house, if you're looking at repainting, have a really good close look at your windows. Have a look at how old the windows are. Maybe changing the rubber seals in the windows will make a difference to sound. If you look at it and get even get in somebody to have a look and, and, and give some information and some feedback on how your windows are, you'd be surprised at what you can do. And then check the manufacturer's claims. Again, go to a reputable website like WERS or somewhere like that. Don't have a sales guy land in on your floor and say, oh, my window does this, my window does that, and buy the windows off. Do your research. It's entirely up to you. You're responsible for what you put in your house. Okay. And in the case of, like I said earlier, like anywhere you're close to a loud source of noise, like a, a train line or next to a shipping yard or um, a commercial industry, consult an acoustic engineer. It, it, it really does make a difference. Okay. Again, just a, a quick reminder. Those two website is yourhome.gov.au. They get all your information on Windows. Just scroll through there. There is a mine of information in there. Just look it up. It's all there for you guys. And then WERS. I've, I've touched on WERS several times in there. If the company is reputable, they will be on WERS. Their product will be on there. Okay. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Again, to everybody at Renew and Sustainable House Day. And thank you to everybody for tuning in today. Appreciate it. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. That has sparked, to be unsurprised tonight, a seriously large number of questions. Um, we are going to come back to all of those questions in the Q&A session. I have a feeling that um, our next speaker, Michael Tolhurst, may um, knock some of them off on the way through. Uh, Michael, please do not feel obliged to do so. Um, stick to whatever it is you did want to say for now. Uh, we've got plenty of time to come back to them later. I've got a list of my own ones for Brian as well. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the lift in the three-story building and whether it was inside or outside the thermal envelope, but that's got nothing to do with windows. So we'll save that for the day. We can actually, you know, have a beer and things in the same room. Anyway, moving on. Our next speaker is Michael Tolhurst. He is an architect. He lives in Canberra. Um, he's got over 20 years experience architecting and mainly in commercial and large scale projects. Um, he's been a certified passive house designer since 2016, which means he's up for renewing his um, designer credentials, which may well explain why he's very close to completing the certification on his new family home, which will be a certified passive house. Michael is going to talk now about, um, about windows, obviously from an architect's perspective, but also he's going to use his own, as, as with all good architects, use your own house as a case study. Uh, Michael, over to you. Okay, thanks Andy. Um, hi everyone. Um, as Andy suggested, um, I'm in Canberra, Passive House Designer, Architect, and um, yep, using my own home as a case study. Um, discovered Passive House, didn't discover it, but came across it five or six years ago when it just really resonated with me. It seemed to make sense. The, um, the rigorous nature of the design and construction made sense, so I thought I would use it for my own family home. Um, now I'm not going not gonna to delve too much into the passive house um, technicalities, um, but I'll just talk about how, how I selected and configured and designed the windows for my own home. So as Andy said, I'm in Canberra. Look, it's a cold climate um, in terms of the Australian context, but it's still relatively mild compared to Europe. And we also get occasionally very hot summers of 40 plus degrees. So we've got, we've got the two extremes to deal with. Um, so I think construction started um, early 2020 and was finished sort of a few months ago. We've moved in. It's actually not finished, but we're living here now. So it's a, it's a first world problem. Um, we can't complain too much about that. Um, I've got an Instagram account. If you want to check it out, Narrabunda House, uh, there's lots of information on there. So we are in a, um, a, a fairly suburban context in Canberra. So it's fairly, fairly, fairly standard in that sense. We don't have, I don't have a lot of, um, there's not a lot of views to try and take in. We don't have any, any noise issues really. So it's, it's fairly standard. This is a, um, an aerial photograph before construction started with the, uh, the site highlighted. You can see it's a, it's a 1940s workers' cottage that really didn't have any redeeming, redeeming features other than the, um, the Canberra brickwork, which we've salvaged and reused. Um, some large deciduous trees to the north, which we really wanted to retain, and that drove a lot of the design. But single story, low rise construction either side, um, not really any overshadowing. Some 
street noise coming from this road um, and touching on Brian's comments earlier. If I had my time again, I'd probably, the windows facing the street, I'd probably use thicker glass or laminated glass to help a bit more with the acoustics. Um, this is the most recent aerial image that I've been able to get hold of. Uh, this was in April this year, um, about when we moved in. Um, you can see the, the property next door is, is now being redeveloped. Um, and that was always something that we were conscious of. And the windows actually took that into account on that side. Um, but you can see there's a lot of the, the long sides face northwest and uh, southeast. North is straight up the page. So it's not the best orientation in terms of a solar passive, a strictly solar passive design. Um, so what Passive House actually allowed me to do is to, is to um, compensate for the lack of uh, solar gain, natural solar gain. And the other, the other factor playing into this is we have a, an attached greenhouse, which is quite substantial here on the northern corner. My wife is a horticulturalist and that was, that was one of her must-haves in this project. I think we had several, but one was a greenhouse and one was that was Passive House certified. So we've almost got the greenhouse working and we're in the process of Passive House certification, touch wood. So I thought I'd start on this and I think Brian touched on this as well. <clears throat> I, think, I think often houses in Australia can be overglazed. This is an extract from the National Construction Code, which talks about, it essentially says that as a bare minimum code compliant, the minimum you're allowed to build, every habitable room in a building, which is bedrooms, living rooms, dining rooms, that sort of thing, the window area should be as a minimum 10% of the floor area of that room. And similarly, for ventilation requirements, if you're relying on natural ventilation, there needs to be an openable area of 5%. So it means if you've got a 20 square meter room, the window needs to be, or the glass area technically needs to be two square meters, which isn't, isn't that much. Um, and, the, and the openable panel, whether it be a sliding sash, an awning sash, a casement or a tilt and turn needs to be 5%, which is what, one square meter. Um, and interestingly, something I've come across recently is, is the NCC, it's sort of silent on what that sash is, whether it's an awning window that op only opens a little bit, whether it's a casement window that opens the whole way, um, whether it's a, uh, a sliding window on an upper floor level, which has restrictors, which means it can only be opened 125 millimetres. None of that is taken into account. It's just the size of the sash. Uh, which was a little little bit interesting that I discovered recently. So I think at one point I had a spreadsheet where I was just I was just second guessing the window sizes because I was seeking passive house certification. I knew the windows were going to be expensive. I didn't want to make them larger than they needed to be. So it was just something I had in the back of back of my mind to make sure it wasn't too much and it wasn't too little. We ended up going with. Um, Logic House windows who are, who are based in Canberra. These are imported windows. And as Brian touched on, these are the timber aluminium windows. They're basically timber um, with an aluminium uh, protection on the outside. So we get all the thermal performance of the timber and the warmth inside, but we get the durability of the aluminium outside. Um, and you can see some of the specs here. They're available in double and triple. Um, you can see the U values are very low. The sound reduction wasn't actually something that I took into account when we ordered them. Um, air tightness, not actually sure what that means. All I know is it's passed the air tightness test um, for passive house certification. We achieved 0 0.18 air changes per hour. Um, this is direct, this is just a screen grab from the Logic House website. Um, this is what the average price is noted as. This is might be a little bit old now. Um, it's a Passive House certified component. So the reasons we chose it is it's Passive House certified, the timber internal, aluminium external, the choice of timbers and colors and external profiles. I think it ended up being quite cost effective and I'll touch, touch on the numbers later. And they're actually based in Canberra. So, so there's local support, which was really helpful. But on the negative side, there's a five month lead time 
between when you order them and when they turn up in a shipping container, which can be problematic um, just in terms of programming of the construction and also financing it. And potentially, I think the size restrictions because you're limited to the size of the shipping container. So if you wanted really tall windows, you'd probably have to break it down into several panels. This is a, uh, a floor plan of my house with the all of the windows and glazed doors are highlighted in red. I think there's about 12, yeah, the 12. So Brian mentioned that the Australian average was about a 30% ratio of window to floor area. So for my house, that's actually worked out at 22%, which is quite low. I think partly that's because I was conscious of the cost of the windows. And it's also partly because of this greenhouse situated on the, the north corner. So if we didn't have the greenhouse, if that wasn't part of the brief, there would have been a different plan and I'd probably have more windows and it would have been closer to the 30% that uh, Brian talked about. But certainly getting much higher than that in some climates is getting too much and that's going to really negatively affect the performance unless you're in a mild climate. Sydney might be okay, but somewhere like Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Canberra, Tasmania, or up north where it's hot, it's gonna to be too much. So, and you can see here, I've, I've extrapolated from, from our costs, what the average cost per square meter for the windows and glazed doors has been. $1,150 supplied, that, that includes shipping, that includes GST. And look, I, for a high performance home and high performance windows, I actually don't think that's too bad. But you can see if, if we extrapolate the Australian average of 70 square meters, more than 41 square meters, that's, that's an extra $30,000. So I think targeting a high performance home and you're looking to use high performance windows, whether it's triple glazed imported or you know, high performance double glazed manufactured locally, the windows can really affect your budget and it's just really something to keep in mind and you need to use them sensibly. Just a few um, elevations to give you an idea. This is the, the Northeast elevation showing this is the largest window in the house. It's sort of a French door with um, glazed side lights. You can see the greenhouse. This is the Southeast elevation facing the street. There's not much glazing here, just this studio where I'm sitting now. Um, we actually, and there's some photos later, we actually decided to use glazed doors everywhere throughout rather than solid timber doors, um, partly because it allows more light in and they're a little bit more cost effective, probably quite a lot more cost effective. Um, the long elevations, these face the side boundaries. You can see the windows down here. This is the southeast, limited solar gain and facing neighbors and fences. There's not really any reason to make huge amounts of glazing. We're just going to plant hedges for privacy. Um, the northwest elevation, we do rely on some solar gain. This is the main bedroom and the bathroom. These two windows in particular, they have external blinds, motorized blinds, which I've got some photos on later. And that was to control the unwanted summer solar gain. Okay, some photos of the doors and windows. So this is, this is the largest window door assembly in the house. It's nearly four meters by 2.4 meters high. For all of these examples, there's a, there's a key plan highlighting where it is, the floor plan and the elevation just to give you some uh, context and some specs, some um, statist statistics of the windows on the side here. So we're talking, this is, this is from the, um, the quote from Logic House, the U-value 1.01 for the French door component and 0 0.95 for the windows on the side. These windows on the side are both tilt and turn. So you can see it's just tilted at the moment, but they also um, hinge inwards. And there's a photo later on that shows that. $1,400 per square meter is what this window door assembly worked out at. It's one of the more expensive ones, but it's also something, this is coming from the passive house modeling. So this is, this is one window that actually earns, earns its keep in terms of the solar gain. It actually, it, 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 it gains more energy than it loses over the course of a year. It faces Northeast, so it's going to. And that's why we've got some shading. 
This is a window next to that. This is the kitchen window. You can see it just here. Um, again, it's a winner in terms of the energy balance, but it's much cheaper, $950 a square meter, because it's, it's much simpler. Um, doesn't have all the, all the hardware associated with the doors and a much better U value, 0 0.89. This is the window facing the street, the studio. So it faces south. It basically gets very little, very little solar gain. Actually, none in winter, none that you want. The only solar gain it's going to get in winter when the sun is getting very low late in the afternoon. And you can see that's why it actually loses, loses energy. So there's no reason to make this any larger than it needs to be. But it is a... It is, a, it is a workspace, so, so it, it's nice to have natural light in a workspace. So I did make it relatively large, but also thought about there's no point bringing it down to the, to the floor because I might want to have furniture or a desk in front of this window at some stage. And you can see it's worked out at $750 a square meter. So that's actually, that's actually one of the cheapest. And I think that's because it's quite large. The, the, the dollars seem to be in the, in the frame and the hardware. So the larger the window can be, the less it's gonna be per square meter and the less hardware you can have, it's gonna be less per square meter. But having said that, I've seen examples of houses where passive house sort of quality houses where they, they're a bit scared of the openable windows and the hardware and they, they just try and have lots of fixed windows. Personally, Every window in this house has an, an openable component and they're all tilt and turn windows. Um, I think it would have to be a very, very specific uh, scenario to not have an openable element in the window. Maybe if it was a, maybe a bathroom or a, or a walk-in robe or something like that. We don't have examples of those in this house, but we've tried to get good sized openable panels in every room, certainly every habitable habitable room. You can see the um, fly screens came on the tilt and turn panels. These pop off quite easily. Um, these particular windows have mitered corners, so there's no junctions on here. It's really, really schmick, really neat. It's a, it's a really high quality product, I think. I mentioned um, glazed doors. So I think we've got one, two, three, four glazed doors on the house. Actually, maybe five, one, two, three, no, four. Four glazed doors on the house. Um, some people want to have solid timber doors, particularly for their front entry. We decided to just have a glazed door, partly to get light, partly because it's more cost effective. Um, we do have, you can see in the key plan, this is the, the front door here. We are in the process of installing a front fence and gate with a, an intercom out the front. So that was part of a, a security conscious approach um, so that we couldn't have people generally walk straight up to the front door. Um, but you could always put a blind on the door um, if you were concerned about privacy. The doors, as you can see, are more expensive per square meter, $1,500, $1,600 per square meter. Um, Again, that's because of all the hardware associated with them, but I suspect they're still, we never bothered getting, getting solid doors quoted, but I imagine they're quite a bit more expensive. Um, this is a long skinny window here on the dining room. Um, it's intended to be sort of something that you look out while you're seated. You can see it here in the elevation. It basically just looks onto a, what will hopefully eventually be a, a bamboo hedge, which is growing here which screens the neighbours. Again, it, it faces southeast. Not really a lot of solar gain, so there was no reason to make it huge. This is the master bedroom window, uh, faces northwest here. You can see we've incorporated uh, motorised blinds, recessed behind the cladding. Um, only two windows have these blinds, the bathroom and the bedroom, because they face northwest. We considered using a solar control glass to reduce the unwanted solar gain, but decided it's nice to have the solar gain in winter. So let's put a motorized blind on and have the best of both worlds. Blinds are expensive for what they are. So we didn't want to have them on every window. So we've only put them in on these two windows. Um, again, you can see it's quite quite cost effective. 750 a square meter. It's because 
it's really quite large. It's 2.4 meters wide and nearly two meters high. Um, so again, that's why, that's why it's quite cost effective. This is the blind down. We're starting to use it now. So what are we midway through spring? Um, starting to use it now. And I suspect in, in summer, it'll be down quite a lot, but actually controls the light really well. And we've managed to incorporate it quite neatly. This is a funny little window that was a really last minute inclusion. So you can do windows in, in brick veneer cladding. You can do brick veneer in passive house. It's a little bit more fiddly, the detailing, um, and we don't have many of them. This is it here. This was a last minute addition to just have a little visual connection between the kitchen and the greenhouse. Um, it's only, it's less than a meter squared. So it's tiny, but that means it's actually really expensive in terms of dollars per square meter because it's so small. Um, but I think we're, we're really glad we did it. It was a very, it was a very late inclusion. Um, so I think we ordered the windows January or February in 2020 and they turned up in August. So we're ordering, we ordered the windows more than a year before we moved in. So the, the, it does take a bit of um, forward planning when ordering from overseas. There are, there are products available locally um, as Brian was suggesting, they're not, are they as good? That's debatable, but hopefully we get more, we get more products in the market in the near future. This is a picture on the inside of the window. So the next, the next pictures are internal pictures showing a bit more of, of the way we've sort of celebrated the windows. They're such a, they're such an important part of a home and we wanted to celebrate them and the, the chunkiness of the timber and the frames needed to be embraced and celebrated. Um, the pine, we chose the pine finish, which was actually the most cost effective compared to oak or larch. Um, and it's actually one of the better thermally performing timbers of the range. <clears throat> and when we decided on that timber, that actually informed a lot of the, the interior finishes. You can see here, we've created these plywood hoop pine plywood reveals around all the windows to tie in with the, the window frames. And we've used that material on the joinery as well. Sorry. This is an inside internal view of the, the bedroom window showing the blind. So this is the blind closed. So this is a blind that has only a 6% solar transmittance. I hope I've got that right, um, looking up the tech data. But the, um, the view through it is actually, I was surprisingly, I was surprised at how, how well you could see through it. Um, it's a bit glary here because the sun's shining on it, but it does make, it does make a substantial difference to the performance in summer. I'm going to have to hurry through now. My time's running out. These are, this is a view of the tilt and turn windows in the same window. You can see, and we've hardly ever used it at the moment. We've been in here since April. It's now October. So it pro probably because it's been winter, hopefully we um, start to use the windows a little bit more. But you can leave it cracked open, as Brian suggested, just to get some trickle ventilation during the day or overnight if you don't have noise. I doubt we'll ever leave it open at night because there is noise from the road, so we'll close it. Um, we do have a, a ventilation system, so we don't rely on opening the windows for ventilation. But you can see you can throw the window open 180 degrees almost um, to maximize this opening. You can actually hinge the window on either side, depending on the layout of the room. And I liked where the window was sort of unencumbered like this, I like to be able to hinge it on the central mullion so you can swing the window back against itself so it wasn't sitting out in the space and obstructing walking past. Um, internal window furnishings. I think with tilt and turn windows, and I've heard some window furnishing suppliers say they're not real, they're not big fans of the tilt and turn windows because they do impact on what window furnishings you can put on. So we've got two different types of things. We avoided roller blinds in this project. We've either got sort of full height curtains, a sheer or a, um, a block out curtain, which sits behind it, which can be drawn across all the way. And in some areas, the bathroom and the studio, we've got these um, pleated blinds, which are affixed to the inside of the timber frame. 
So you can still open the window. These blinds, these curtains actually draw up from the bottom or they can be pulled down from the top to control privacy, depending on what you want. Uh, this is a shot of the kitchen window. This is an example where it's been hinged on the side. So it's not swinging out in front of the bench. It swings across towards the wall. That seemed to be most, most appropriate. The tilt and turn windows, they're generally up to about 900 millimeters wide. They're, none of them are any wider than that. They're probably a bit, bit less than that. This one's probably about 600. So just tried to think about what was happening in the space. And we didn't want this one swinging out past the edge of the bench top. Again, using the plywood reveal. Um, this is the long linear window in the dining room positioned at 900 high so that we could go get a sideboard or joinery or furniture underneath. <clears throat> you can see the construction happening next door. Uh, that wasn't there when we designed the house. That's gone up quite recently, but it'll all be obscured by, by bamboo. Um, so it's always helpful to, to think about what furniture you're going to have in the space and what you're going to be looking out onto. It's sort of architecture 101, I guess, in that sense. You can see the window here. Um, this is the northeast facing French door. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about passive house and that it's being, it's a sealed box, but you can see I've really tried to make sure that this particular window and door has lots of opening potential. During the day, we can, we can come and go through the, uh, through the door leaf. These are generally always closed. These side lights are tilt and turn window panels. During the evening, we can throw it all open to maximize the ventilation um, if we get a cooling summer breeze come through. Um, and then overnight, we can close the French doors, close the side lights and just have them in the tilted position to get a bit of ventilation if the conditions are suitable. Or we can close the whole thing up. One thing we didn't want was to deal with sliding door tracks and cleaning them. And this, I think we're really happy with this. This was, this was an expensive assembly, but is also much less expensive than one of the, uh, the lift and slide units that we could have put in here. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. I thought I'd finish on a, on a slide that was taken back in August of the glass. This shows frost on the outside of the glass. And I've also taken photos with condensation on the outside of the glass, which is, which is where condensation should be. We've moved for, personally, we've moved from, from at least one house where condensation was always on the inside of the glass and the, the aluminium frame. And so far this winter, we've had none of that, which is fantastic. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fantastic. I hadn't seen Michael's presentation before this evening, but I had a pretty good idea what he was going to say. And I am completely unsurprised that he completely delivered on it. So um, I'm very grateful. And that is partly because I am up next and I'm going to switch my MC hat, which I don't really have for my presenting hat, which I also don't have. You'll have to just imagine the hats. Um, and I am going to talk about a few things around windows. I'm going to, and obviously pre preparing this beforehand, I've tried to avoid repeating some of Michael's things. So I will share my screen now, realizing that I was flicking through. Are we all good to go there, Dave? Yes. Uh, nothing up just yet, Andy. Um, just checking ah. if you've gone to the green share screen button. I thought I did, but evidence would suggest otherwise, wouldn't it? That's okay. Maybe just give that another. Let's give that go. another crack. How's that? Perfect. Awesome. Excellent. Alrighty. So, um, as you will already know, my name is Andy Marlow, and I am a director of um, a couple of companies. One of which is Envirotecture. We have a long, long history with Sustainable House Day. Um, as Brian mentioned before, we think it's awesome. It's a truly fantastic event. Um, obviously, you're all here supporting it this evening. Um, and that's really, really good. Um, the, re the breadth and depth of reach of Renew um, in its current form is just phenomenal. And we just can't speak highly enough of the people who work there, the paid volunteers and just everything that is behind the organization. It's just 
unbelievably fantastic if only uh, government was half as good. Anyway, we'll keep away from that. Um, and Viratech has been around for a very long time. And in the last couple of years, we've fallen hard into the passive case world. As you've gathered from this evening's presentation, it's become a fairly big part of the high performance sustainable home industry in Australia in recent years. We started a new company, uh, well, almost two years ago, actually, um, focusing only on passive house buildings. And these are a couple of um, images of uh, currently certified projects. So like Brian, we have four certified projects, which is pretty good. It's a bit of a race. Um, I think he's gonna beat me though, but anyway, um, that's okay. Happy to be beaten in this one. Um, and the, um, of these, um, three of them are available to view through the Sustainable House Day website as part of um, as part of Sustainable House Day videos. Um, and the one on the bottom left, we will hear a bit more about because I'm going to talk about it a little bit now. But we are also going to be joined by the homeowner and therefore uh, my client and also friend Chris Nunn, um, who will be with us shortly for the Q and A session. So, on that note, we will move on. So um, Michael very eloquently spoke about his windows and, and the heat balance and the energy balance and the costs and the very, and went through in, in, in quite fantastic detail um, the decisions he made and why. Um, I thought that was fantastic. I found it quite useful. Um, and I have done my own simplified version of this because I really wanted to hammer home the point. We have a, I have in our office and therefore everyone else in our office has had to adopt it because that's how it works. Um, we have a mantra which is basically frame bad, glass good. Um, and it's not really because, it's partly because of cost, it's partly because of functionality, um, it's partly because of simplicity. And, and as Michael was alluding to, basically these windows can become really expensive, but if you know how to design them and you optimize them, then you end up with some, you can end up with some really, really high performance outcomes at prices that are obviously more than a bog standard aluminium window, um, but not as stratospheric as most people would have you believe. Um, five, 10 years ago, we'd spend about 10, up to 10% of our of a construction budget would go on windows. With our passive house projects, um, some of them have come in at around 5%. Um, some still come at around 10%. Um, but the point is that the cost of windows in these really high performance homes is no greater than when we were using locally made not terrible by any stretch, but not 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 as good aluminium windows, um, say five plus years ago. So I want to make that point. Um, Michael also um, showed a couple of images of um, of the openings of these windows. This is the um, the front facade. Sorry, I should explain. So basically, what we've been doing on these windows is, as you can see, um, the upper ones there. That's um, bedroom, bathroom, bedroom on the upper level. Um, and basically, we're doing the same trick that Michael's doing. So we're maximizing maximizing or optimizing the opening sash, but then we're having a fixed sash. The mechanisms are expensive relative to not having a mechanism. Um, and every time you've got an opening part, it needs frame and an opening part, and therefore the frames get fatter. So you lose glass area. So you lose daylight. You lose, if it's getting heat gain, you lose heat gain as well. So more frame equals less performance and more money. So we're optimizing them for these reasons. And I'm sure this will come up later, but the window bottom right um, is into the living room and it is a ginormous fixed pane of glass. Um, originally, it was gonna have an opening sash. Um, we, upon discussion and various, you know, little dis yeah, discussions amongst us and, and with the client, um, decided that it would look pretty schmicko if we just had a giant pane of glass. We've got a ventilation system, we've got lots of openings, so we don't need it for natural cooling and therefore it, got done this way and it is absolutely stunning. So these windows, as Michael said, when you optimize these sash widths, so we, we tend to max out um, with around about 1200 wide. Um, that's about what you can, what the hinges can cope with. Um, and therefore mo a lot of these windows are 1200 wide sashes with then corresponding fixed um, panel next to them. Um, this image is slightly distorted from the camera angle and was taken during construction, as you can tell by the total lack of furniture. Um, but you can see the scale of these openings. The window on at the far side, the closed one, is about the same width um, and opens up onto the up, up onto the green roof, which is still um, waiting for the plants to arrive and grow. So um, this overall strategy applies to all of our has been applied to all of our jobs in terms of um, maximizing um, the glass area, minimizing the frame area 
and that's really helping to contribute to our performance to the performance of the projects. Um, this is the front elevation of, of, same, of the same house. This is the, um, the Asquith Passive House. Um, and what I want to touch on here is that we've got, you can see on the front, so the front face is due north, which brings a whole bunch of less than not optimal um, strategies. Most people would prefer their backyard to face north so that you get sun in your backyard in winter. This is not the block of land that our clients own, and therefore we have to resolve that. So um, the whole passive house strategy really helps with that, but today's not about that as such. Um, but what this is about is the fact that those north facing windows are shaded by fixed eaves. They're, um, they're fairly deep. Um, they're giving really good shade to those, um, to those, north, facing, um, those north facing windows. And it works like an absolute works like an absolute charm. Actually, we say that the house has only just been finished about three months ago, so it's finished in June, um, and therefore we believe, and all of the modelling and all of the data and everything we know suggests that it's going to work. Um, we'll revisit this next year um, when we will find out how it actually goes over summer. But we are very confident we're going to be doing it. Now, what I do want to talk about, and Michael uh, mentioned elements of this in his talk, is around the shading of windows that do not face north. Um, we, um, we have um, in this house, we've got a couple of windows on the west facade, which you can see there. There's a couple on the east. The east is slightly different because there's some trees over there that are giving pretty good shade anyway, but these are fairly exposed. Um, the neighbour is currently a single, which you would have seen here. Oh, no, you can't. Anyway, the neighbour to the west is single storey, so there's no real shade to these windows at all. Um, so we opted to put these external blinds on, and I've. Uh, this is a bit of a morphing of the of the presentations. Um, Michael spoke very eloquently of, uh, about a lot of the the sort of the nice, beautiful elements of um, of how he's done his house, and and Brian touched on some of the techie numbers. So I'm going to do a little bit of both here. And these little tables at the bottom are some numbers that I just threw together yesterday, or when I say threw together, as in I asked a piece of software to give them to me. Um, and what I wanted to do was just really quickly illustrate the importance of shading and how it needs to change as you move around the building. Um, windows are a funny thing because we talk about windows and think about the window, but in reality, the things that matter with windows, as well as the actual materials, are where they go, how big they are, and how they relate to all the other things. Um, whether it's aesthetic and what it looks at or whether it's how it relates to the sun, all of these things are incredibly important. So in some ways, windows are the simplest thing in the world. In other ways, they're extremely complex. So these tables at the bottom are just to illustrate the difference between, a, um, it was a 1.5 square meter window in a wall facing um, either north or west. And I've rotated it a couple of times to go from north to west. And I had an, an eaves um, or a horizontal projection, we'll call it an eave, um, at various heights above the window heads. And all I really want to point out with the numbers is that when you turn around a corner and go from north to west, even when you pull the, the, the shading device right down to the head of the window, so it's as close to the top of the window as it can be without blocking the window, it still lets in more heat in summer than a north-facing window that's got a, 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 an overhang set up above it. Um, on the north side, you want that overhang to be higher than the head of the window. You want your winter sun to be able to penetrate um, into that window. That's nearly always the case. Um, so you don't want it too low down. On the west, you really need to shade that window as much as possible. So in this project and on a lot of our projects now, we're doing, as Michael did at his house, we're moving towards using external blinds. Um, yes, they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily very, they're not stupidly expensive. They're not particularly cheap. So you like, like the window itself, you use them well. You use them when you need to. Um, and, and it means that you do think about these things a whole lot, a whole lot more. I'm sure we'll come back to this later on. One of the other things that I did want to reiterate is, um, and Michael mentioned, um, was talking about the heat balance on various windows. Nearly every window in a, in a project that doesn't face the equator, so north in Australia, um, or within maybe 10 to 20 degrees of it will over the light uh, over the year um, will be a loser of heat energy and therefore you really want to make sure that you, you've really got to sort of be careful when you have west east or even south facing windows because you are going to lose more energy through them than you gain and therefore you want to make sure that you place them place them well maximize the benefit from getting them 
and, um, and there's been a few questions which we will come to later about how you know how to do these things. Um, the short answer is um, thermal modeling. Um, experience is incredibly useful because you know which questions to ask, um, but even people who've been doing this for even longer than I've been doing this, um, and that it's always comes back to the numbers. Um, you can have a really good idea, but you really want to actually get, get data, get data. Oh, I have lost my ability to move on. Okay, um, this one. So um, this is just a continuation of shading. Michael kind of um, had a similar series of images. This is, a, this is the house we did at Thornley a couple of years ago. Um, that's a bunch of water tanks inside your living room because it's a good place to keep water in a lightweight house in particular. But what the, the point of the slide is that there's a very large window behind. It's about six meters long all up, or is it 4.8? I've already forgotten, it's very long. Um, and it's got two very large um, 1200 wide um, sashes at either end that open for ventilation to help cool down that thermal mass when needed. But when you go around the front, um, you'll see that it's also got one of those lovely blinds on it. And it's, um, it's a similar blind. These windows are from the same company that Michael's came from. Um, and the, the blind has that same slightly different numbers, but this one blocks out about 18% of all of the solar gain that was gonna come through. Uh, but again, when you're inside and it's down, you can see through it, you still get daylight. It's a very, it, it's a very different way of experiencing shading of a window. Um, than a lot of the um, old, you know, more, more um, commonly seen versions of external blinds. Um, basically, you're trying to keep glass, uh, solar heat off the, off the glass. Um, and there's many ways you can do that with a whole bunch of physical things that you put in the way. Um, but the, some of these, um, the fabrics that do this and still allow light in and vision out um, make it a much more compelling um, answer. Traditionally in passive solar houses on really hot days, it wasn't uncommon just to close the curtains. That works. Um, it helps reduce heat, heat transfer through glass, um, but it doesn't necessarily make for a great way to, to live for a whole season. For a single day, sure, it's a fairly sensible reaction, but for multiple days, that could be problematic. On that note, um, I do also want to touch briefly on the window coverings as well. Um, a few questions in there. Um, uh, in the chat, but also Michael did touch on this. Um, these are a couple of shots out of the house, the little laneway house we did. Um, we have on the whole been using um, the honeycomb blinds as well um, when we need them. Um, they, they're pretty clever. You can pull, pull them up and push them down. You can stop and start them anywhere in between. One of the key things um, that I think a lot of people struggle with initially with these kind of with these high performance windows is um, disassociating the historical need for your window covering to be a form of insulation. I grew up in the UK where in the eight, 1980s UPVC windows were becoming you know, the thing of the time, um, which alarms you when you think about how or where Australia is currently at. Um, but even then, um, we very much relied on curtains as a way of staying warm. Um, once you get into these really high performance level of windows, um, especially in our climate where it, depending on where you are, but on the whole, it's not minus five outside, then the, cur the curtains or the, the, the whatever they are, the window coverings themselves are actually much more about privacy and sense of security than they are about anything particularly thermal. Um, they help thermally, sure, but once you've got something that's already really darn good, putting something else really darn good on something else doesn't make it that much better. So um, disassociating those two relationships um, is, is, I think, quite important. And Michael's strategy with the sheer curtains, and we've had some clients who've done that as well, is, I think, quite useful. They look lovely. It's about what they look like. And they do the job really nicely. And thermally, you've got a double or a triple glazed window. So why, you know, you don't need to go that far. Now, I also want to talk, we're way over time, so I'm gonna go swiftly through this next part. Um, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to this particular publication. It's relatively new, um, the High, High Performance Construction Details Handbook. Um, it's published by the Passive House Institute of New Zealand. Um, it was almost solely written by one human, a guy called Jason Quinn, who is just so unbelievably clever, it's quite scary. And what I've done is um, very swiftly pilfered a couple of things because I want to talk about the importance of how the windows go in the wall. And I want to keep it fairly straightforward, um, but just illustrate some points. Um, his handbook is several hundred pages long and tells you everything about 
um, bog standard New Zealand construction, which is remarkably similar to Australian bog standard construction, and, um, and then basically steps you up through tiers of how to do things well. So I've taken three examples. So we've gone on the left is a bog standard aluminium single glaze, uh, uh, fairly terrible aluminium window. In the middle is a pretty, uh, a fairly good UPVC double glazed window, not dissimilar to the sort of things Brian was um, talking about. Um, and then on the right hand side, it's the same window. What you'll notice is that the position of the window in the wall changes each time. So it goes from being on the outside in the first two to being in the middle on the last one. And this is all about the relationship between the window and the insulation layer in your wall. So you can see the insulation hopefully here, that little symbol means insulation, and, and therefore the windows outside of it. These numbers here, this, this is called an FSRI number, is an indication of the likelihood of getting condensation. Um, it is very safe to say that the, the one on the left is a guarantee of condensation. Um, it's nice for certainty in life, but you'd prefer that the answer was a definite no. Um, the one in the middle would, depending on where you are, be a very likely no. And the one on the right would be, except for in fairly arctic conditions, would be a pretty definite no to the condensation. So the position of the window changes and the way that this is often best understood is um, looking at these drawings, which are called isotherms. And this just shows the flow of the heat from inside um, which is set at 20 degrees in the modeling to outside, which in Jason's case was set at zero degrees. And what we're seeing there is you see how the heat flows and you can see in the numbers, the temperature that you will experience at the coldest point on the inside. And you can see on that top one that in the zero outside, 20 degrees inside with that window in that wall, in that position, that it will be about 2.39 degrees, which I think we can safely say is not comfortable. So on that note, I will leave you with this lovely t-shirt that some friends in North America have put together. Um, if you understand isotherms and um, get the passive house world, I think this is quite a comical t-shirt. Um, others may not, but that's okay. And on that note, I feel it is time for me to stop talking as presenter and revert back to being a MC, stop sharing my screen. And at that note, we are gonna transition to the Q&A part of the evening. So, thank you, Andy. That was lovely. But no worries, Andy. That was great. Um, we're joined now by two other panelists. Um, we have um, we have Chris Nam, who is the owner of the recently certified Passive House Premium House in Asquith in Northern Sydney, and we also have um, Daniel, who is the architect of the long paddock i've lost my notes the thinking paddock house the feast <laughs> that's a bad thing to get right i forgot to think that's not going to look good um the thinking paddock house in tasmania for which he was the architect um it's a high performance home built for his parents i'm going to ask the two of them to introduce themselves um, reasonably briefly now, and then I will regroup while that occurs, and we will then go to some of the questions from the audience. Um, gentlemen, whoever jumps in first gets to talk first. I don't mind. Sure, why not? Um, I'm Chris Nunn. I'm the owner of the Asquith Passive House, and, and the uh, images of that house in his presentation. Uh, I've lived in it for about three months. Uh, I work as a sustainability consultant uh, for a Big property company, and uh, I'm all about sustainable building. So it was a it was a real delight to actually build and now live in a passive house with these awesome windows. Uh, yes, and as uh, Andy introduced me before, uh, my name's Daniel, and I'm the director of Open Creative Studio. And I finished uh, we finished construction on Thinking Paddock House uh, in December last year for my parents um, and yeah that was a house where we started off uh, hitting some really great numbers um, in the performance and it was you know really exciting for me as someone who's loved sustainable design uh, for my career and then uh, my mum because of the, the got totally seduced by the view and she said no nah, we need way more west facing windows make them bigger so I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested in what happens to uh, a house when you um, start to start to change uh, you know how many how many windows you have how big they are and um, what uh, what uh, orientation they're facing 
Fantastic. I'm sure we're going to get a bunch of those questions. We've already got a, a shirt load racking up. Um, I'm going to throw the first question back, and there is no real system to my madness here. Um, there's been quite a few questions relating to um, issues around ventilation and the, what I'm interpreting to be the balance between why would you have all these windows closed up that are really high performance and how do you ventilate your building? Um, Chris, as someone living in one of these high performance homes, admittedly only for three months, but it was winter, um, can you talk a bit about fundamentally how much you're actually opening the windows, how the ventilation works and, and how that pans out for you as a human? Yeah, so in a passive house, which this is, you've got a mechanical ventilation system providing continuous flow of fresh air to every room, every habitable room all the time, and then it's extracted out through a heat exchanger. So it's done really efficiently, but you've got your fresh air um, from the mechanical ventilation system already. So if you've ever been had the pleasure of being in a passive house, um, you do have this sense of freshness. It's as if you're in a normal naturally ventilated house with the windows open. That's kind of how it is all the time in the house. So you really don't feel like you need to open the windows. So we've been through winter, it's been cool. Uh, occasionally the heating's um, been operating. Um, I haven't felt the need to open the windows um, to get fresh air. But when I do, you know, when it's a beautiful sunny day, this is my study. I, I, you know, we're in lockdown here in Sydney and uh, I've been working in this room. And, you know, I, I during this day, in the middle of the day when the sun's shining, absolutely, I crack that window open um, and have it fully open. And it's enjoyable just to have the thermal delight of the sun shining in and the, the sense of the breeze and you can hear the birds. And But, but that's the reason why you open a, a window in a passive house is because you want that connection to the outside, whether it's the the noise of the birds or or the the listening to the, the wind rustling in the trees. It's not because you need the ventilation and it's getting stuffy. And that's the big difference with a passive house versus a normal naturally ventilated house is it's optional to open the window, not essential. Cool, thanks, Chris. Daniel, there's a few little questions coming up. Would you like to talk about your west facing windows and how you did create the balance between um, making them work and not cooking your parents in the summer? <laughs> well, that was the very first thing that we had to say um, when we had that discussion, which was, you know, upping the, the sheer wall area with that many windows facing west. I said, you know, you're going to have very severe temperatures in summer for sure, even though they're in Tasmania, which is a cooling, uh, sorry, a warming climate. So they're trying to warm the house more than they're trying to cool it. But um, yeah, I mean, they moved in in December and we did have some uncomfortable days. And um, yeah, at that point, my folks also hadn't committed to external blinds or internal blinds. Um, they said they wanted to experience it first. And I said, okay, you, you go for it. Um, and uh, yeah, after putting up with it for about six months, they decided to put uh, internal blinds on. That was just a sheer cost reason um, against, you know, my advice. I was saying, you know, use external blinds. It would have been uh, more beneficial because, you know, the, the window still heats up. That's the other thing in summer, which I sort of, I, I worry about. So some of that um, solar again is going to be trapped inside um, with the internal blinds. Um, but because it's a warming climate, um, the winter that they just went through um, with the internal blinds closed, um, the, the house was nice and warm in the afternoon. So that's one of those things that sometimes I've been talking about with some of my other colleagues who work in sustainability is, you know, if you've got the orientation wrong, try to work the problem a little bit if you can. Um, but still overall, you know, our our energy efficiency, efficiency dropped dramatically because most of those windows, the largest windows are in our living space where, where they're spending most of their time. So while the rest of the house is still working really hard um, thermally, that, that living space is, um, is sort of bringing the average down across the project. So... That sort of balancing act is what I think people need to, to think about um, making sure that if, when the sun is absolutely pelting you, that you will have to close those windows down or close the access from the sun into the house down as best as you can. Okay, and they've still resisted the external blinds? They haven't gone back for those? Yeah, so yeah, they're they're just just using double internal mm -hmm. blinds at the moment, and that's been taking care of the the really harsh afternoon winter sun. Mm -hmm. um, so they said that they they keep them down for about an hour every day, um, and yeah, we're going to see what what happens with this next summer coming up. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Brian, there's been lots of interest in the blinds, the cost of the blinds, where they come from and whether they have beneficial, they seem to be in longevity. Um, what's your experience on in Perth in terms of, I guess, that balance between external blinds, what I'll call regular shading, i.e. not things that move, um, and also the, the solar heat gain coefficients or the G values of glass? How are you, have you got a, have you got rules of thumb or is it all very bespoke still? Nah, to be honest, we, we try and steer away from the blinds because they're not available here. So you guys have availability over there. We do not here. So if we do blinds, we do them on the inside. Um, the only time we really push for blinds like that would be when we put a Velux window. If we put in a Velux window, we would probably have remote opening or remote operated with a remote blind on it to just blank it out because you, radiation coming from the, from the roof is just not what you want. You know what I mean? It's, it's nice in winter, but it's not what you want in summer. Um, I'm interested to know, and I saw a lot of running commentary in the chat and the questions about those blinds. If somebody can stick it in there where they got them, um, a company where they got them, I'll, I'll be on to them as well, for sure. Um, the only thing we're looking at at the moment is we've got a, a, an FZ um, mm -hmm. certified passive house. And we're looking at some kind of a blind system for that because to import the windows and F said, like everyone in the industry knows the para hammer are where it's at. And yeah, the prices are just, they're frightening. Absolutely frightening. If you find a cost effective solution to that, you should give me a call. Cause I think as you well know, there's a lot of people looking for better answers to that question. Yeah. We're, we're working on it, Andy, but yeah. it's, it's a tough one with the regulations and F said at the moment, it's, it's, it's a hard sell, you know? Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Um, on that note, maybe just uh, on the um, on the external blinds, uh, as was supplied by Logic House, and you know, to Andy's point about cost, I think that the total cost for the windows in this house, which is a pretty big house, was about fifty thousand dollars out of a, a million build, so it was five percent. Um, and then the blinds were about three grand. So the two west facing windows um, have those external blinds, and they're about three thousand one hundred dollars. So. In the grand scheme of things, they were very inexpensive and they provide a lot of shading to the West. Um, and we've used them already, even in the sort of winter, spring months. Yeah, so they're good for shading, but not good for FZ. So, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, so they're fantastic for shading, but we're looking for a solution for FZ at the moment. I do have one, Brian. We can have a chat later. Oh, um, good. It's, good. I look, I'm not saying it's the cheapest way to do it, but it works. Okay. So. Uh, Michael, did you want to add anything to the blinds conversation? Chris has already let the cat out of the bag about where we've all been buying them from. I was just going to say that the, the costs that Chris mentioned are pretty much on par with, with, with my house here in Canberra, blinds yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're to, to, if you've got poorly designed windows facing the wrong direction and then you have to shade them, you're just doubling up on costs, aren't you? You just, you're paying extra for the glass, the windows, which are more expensive than cladding. And then you need to shade them with some device. So the more you can minimize how much you have to do that, the better. So um, we were able to, to limit that to just the two, the two windows facing, facing west. And it sounds like, Chris, your place is much, much the same. But, but you know, equally, there are some places where the windows uh, have, have the motorized blinds on all the windows on three sides probably and that that's where it adds up i would think indeed it would there's been a few questions looking at asking around um i guess whether they're rules of thumb but you know u values or g values for particular parts of the country um brian do you have any um sort of standards that you use Standards is the wrong word, but I guess default positions you fall back to in, in the windows you're using and why yeah. they are, what they are is, the other, is my other component to that. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to try and be level-headed here. I'm biased, obviously. Everybody knows that because I'm passive house. So we're always looking for the best performance, the highest performance for the cheapest price. But if we just step back a little bit and look for like what's in the industry at the moment and what's available for with the best performance, you'll probably get some good products out there You know that are... 2.5 to 3, you know what I mean? You can probably get some aluminium double glazed units, you know, not the single glaze that are not thermally broken. They're still not the best, but if you're looking at, and a lot of this is based, you got to base this around, 
the conversation needs to come about the, the new construction codes and energy efficiency because we know that that's a that's a big deal that's coming in right now so windows is going to be one of those portions where we're going to have to get better if we're going to meet these these new regulations and um, to answer that question what's the number i would say you should be looking for you know 1.6 to 1.9 if you're looking at your standard industry try and get below 2.5 if you can just try and get below 2.5 it's a difficult to ask but try try in the passive house industry we've built certified passive you know for between 1.3 and 1.6 ideally you're one you're 0. 0.9 or less um it does tend to be more difficult but i think the biggest one out of all that would be your climate your orientation and your design i, I think the number would be you know if, if you can get below 2.5 fantastic go for it you, you like that's that's my advice go to the words website have a look what's there like i said in my presentation the words website has all the information if you find a window that you like and you like the look of it because a lot of this has to do with aesthetics as well it's got to work functionality has got to work the product's got to have longevity you got to have manufacturer's warranty these are all things that are very important when it comes to the performance of the window go to the words website if it's not on there i'd be steering away from it that's a very fair comment um there's been a lot of questions around retrofitting and the options for um, the questions have varied for what can I do to my single glazed window? How do I deal with colonial bars? Um, yeah. I think all of us on the panel will be familiar with, um, with, with all the various situations. Um, would anybody like to comment on options, things they've seen done well, or maybe potentially more helpfully, things they've just seen done badly that didn't really help? I think primarily, if you could, if there's any way you could retrofit your current windows to have a double glazed unit in it, that would probably be your best scenario. So if, if the current frame facilitates putting in a, a double glazed unit, that's probably your cheapest option because you're not doing anything structurally, you're just changing the glazing. I, I Personally, I think that's your best start. If you wanted to go cheaper than that, again, check the rubber seals, change all the rubber gaskets, seal around the windows. If there's cracks, gaps, like get a, a foam. We use um, uh, Ilford, Ilbrook, Ilbrook foam. So it's an expanding foam, it's high performance. It's airtight. It's good um, thermal, value, thermal insulation values. So try and seal up all the cracks on the outside and make it weather tight and airtight and, and then put like a cover strip on it and paint it in. That I, I would say try and stop your infiltration from the external to the internal and then try and stop your heat loss from the internal to the external. So try and seal up what you've got right now if you can't afford to change your windows. I think that's probably the biggest thing. If you could do that inexpensively in a renovation and then try and get a double glazed unit in it after that. Lo locally sourced, I think, is where you got. You just got to look. You got to try and find who somebody that's doing it, somebody that's trialed it. You know what I mean? Sure. Michael, Daniel, anything to... um? Add into that. No, that's okay. Um, our experience has been similar. Um, we've we've done a few projects where we've retrofitted into timber into timber windows. Um, we did a really interesting financial analysis on it once, and it panned out to be almost the same cost to replace that to replace the glazing because it was a double hung, so there were lots of bits of glass. Um, versus, it was the same cost to do that as it was to buy a new window of the same size but as you say brian the problem the issue was that you then had to remove the window install the window fix up everything around it with architraves etc etc so you didn't actually it wasn't the same financially once you dug into the difference and it worked exceptionally well at the end of the day they did a very nice job of redoing the counterweights and, and the seals and everything else so it is doable um it's not cheap cheap but then it's very labor intensive uh, I, again like th th there's a lot of questions in the chat about the retrofit and stuff yeah. if people are looking to increase the performance of their existing window that's a difficult ask like, it is and it's unfortunately it's due to the current stock that's already there when you've got and i say this very candidly when you've got an inferior product you you can you know what i mean you you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear kind of thing you can dress it up as much as you want, but at the end of the day, you can only do a little bit with the performance of it if it's just not there. Like I would think changing the glazing, even if you had single glazing, change it to maybe a thicker glazing or a lamy or, you know, there's a few things you can do, but you got to pitch that. you got to sit down with an Excel sheet and like you just pointed out, Andy, you got to work out 
what it's going to cost you versus what you're going to gain from it, you know? There's been a couple of questions about single glazing and low E glass as well. And I've got a particular thing about that. We, we wrote a few articles a couple of years ago, just where single glazing will get condensation on the inner pane. Um, it's sold as a way to solve a, a heat gain problem, which in, it, it can help with. Um, but I put, put all of that aside and do you want condensation in winter, which is what single glazing will give you. So, yes. Okay, um, back to the questions um, to the others. Um, I wanted to chat, um, Michael, could you talk a little bit more? You, you, you were speaking about the lift and slide doors. Could you explain how they actually work? Um, and also, um, and, and, and I guess in answering that, that will probably explain why they're so expensive or relatively expensive. Well, we never, we never had them quoted, um, Andy, ah. I think, because, because I just, I'd heard or, or someone had told me that they were expensive. And in the end, in the end, the, the design of the house and the space of that opening, it, it really didn't, it didn't lend itself to, I think I'd drawn it at one point and thought, oh, well, a lift and slide door to maximize the opening. But in the end decided, look, we can get the same opening with just this hinge door. So... Mm, okay. So I, I I can't really speak to the the, the whys and wherefores of of, of that, um, but that's just my, and I probably no I probably did get one quoted at one point, mm, okay. and the the, dif the difference was maybe going from four grand to seven grand, something like that as a ballpark, mm. um, but in the end the, there wasn't it didn't really for for our for our project for our design it didn't really offer that much additional amenity to make it worthwhile yeah but actually actually i think i think what we've ended up with is is a better a better result it's more flexible it gives us it gives us the 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 um the opportunity to control the ventilation better than a, just a sliding door yeah. whereas i mean in in canberra i mean we talk about i was sitting outside um having some lunch today just immediately outside those those doors and um I was saying to someone else in the house, Canberra, it's either too hot, too cold, or it's too hot, or too bright, or too sunny. The sort of it doesn't, it doesn't have that sort of nice sweet spot to be outside as much as other other climates. Even today, it was only 20, 21 degrees, but it was borderline sitting outside in the sun without any shade, um, too much. So we don't we don't really have that sort of in Canberra. We don't need that indoor outdoor flow like you would in in maybe sydney or what other what's another goldilocks climate byron mm. bay perth, perth. perth. <laughs> apparently perth's the best place in the world, someone 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 told me that the other day that perth gets really cold and i thought no it was four degrees the other day <sighs> well there you go um just on the 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 tilt or the, the lift and slide, Andy. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. For me, my opinion of the lift and slide, they're, they're super expensive, but I think they're more, they're very tailored to the passive house industry. Like they're, they're, I think my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I think they were really brought to the fore for an air tightness result rather than, because you still get the same performance. The frame is the same, the glazing is the same. If you have a stacking sliding set, so if you have, you know, four windows with three stackers, you, you get the same effect, but your air tightness is much worse because you now have three panes or three joints or three, you know, moving sashes versus one. And the lift and slide, we all know this. And everyone in the passive house industry knows this. It comes across and it drops down and it seals all the bulb seals and you've got an airtight door. So if you're looking for passive house, I think that's something we should just say to the public out there that like the, the, the lift and slide is not something for everybody. Like it's beautiful, it's fantastic, but it's expensive. Yeah, but they are. And Michael's experience of that rough cost difference is roughly what we've seen as well, which means we've always used them with um with um with caution, shall we say. Um, mm. but yes, there is something quite wonderfully elegant about a yeah. two year old child opening a three hundred kilo door by herself. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's not because she's particularly strong. Um there was a comment directly, a question directly for you, Brian, about skylights. Um, I think you may have already answered it mostly, but um, what are your thoughts about skylights in Passive House? Are you better off just putting in a fake skylight? Uh, you're not better off. It depends on your budget. That's the answer to the question. If you can't afford a skylight and you can't afford a self -auto, like an automated skylight with an automated blind, then you put in the, the one with the solar panel 
I can't, a solar skylight. But it, it's like when it comes to performance, if you put it in a roof, you need to be able to shade it. You need to be able to cancel the performance on it. If you can do that and you can afford it, then there's no issue with it, in my opinion. Um, there's a few questions looking at around the right amount of windows. Um, quest, uh, somebody referencing the NCC, Michael, that you that you brought in about the 10% um, and asking um, what is the mm. right amount of windows? Um, who would like to have a crack at that, Dorothy? I think... I think I saw that in the in the in the Q and A, and that's a that's a difficult that's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? I mean, this, the yes. the problem the problem with the problem with um, so I'll talk about passive solar design. So I'm not talking about passive house design. Passive solar design. It's all rules of thumb, and it's about maximizing the solar gain. Whereas passive house, it's more about optimizing the solar gain. So there's a there's a really fundamental sort of difference there. It's sort of nuanced, but it's it's fundamental. Um, so there's there's no answer for that. I think. I mean, I think from what I've heard and 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 speaking with people and and reading, pass for passive house, it's more like twenty five percent ish ratio of of window area to your um overall floor area of the house the gross floor area um but i think what did i say mine was 22 i think you could probably go to to something like 30 and that would be fine there is no there is no right and wrong it's really a in terms of the um i mean that's really just as a guideline for the overall in terms of, of passive house design you can if you have a, a fantastic view that faces one direction and you want wall to wall floor to ceiling glass go for it that just means you need to compensate elsewhere in the design in the project potentially which kind of brings us back to daniel's parents house and the fundamentally the, the choices that they've made mm. in, yeah in that ball. i was yeah i was going to follow that up it's just the, everyone for anyone who's not a building practitioner i guess the thing to remember is that a window will not perform as well as a wall um and we don't have any windows yet that will perform as well as, you know, a slightly better built um, standard framed wall. And I mean, what people are able to achieve with things like the passive house detailing we're starting to see, um, you know, it, it's spectacular. And so that's a, it's a real conversation, I think, around exactly like what Michael's saying in terms of your livability, your lifestyle, what will, what will bring you joy, and then also balancing, balancing that out with the actual numbers and performance of your house. So if you want it to be as, you know, uh, maybe off grid or you want it to be using hardly any, any power, um, you know, you have to have that real hard discussion about, you know, if we're going to have this, um, you know, a bigger window in this room, we have to think very carefully about how we're going to make that work um, and then talk about it with the, the consultants that you're working with to actually see what the outcome is going to be because, you know, um, like you said, Andy, you know, when you're working with these, uh, you know, energy assessors, they can tell you, you can put that question to them and they can say, you know, this is how much it's going to cost you over, over the life of your building or over the next 20 or 30 years. And it's climate Indeed. dependent as well. Mm. Obviously. I mean, I mean, a large window facing South in, 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 in one, in one, uh, state is going to have different implications than if it was in a, in a, in another state. So obviously the Tasmanias and the Canberras, they're the most challenging in terms of, of winter. Um, but in, in milder climates like Sydney and Perth, it's not, it's not so significant, I don't think. It still needs to be balanced and weighed up, but it's not, it's not anywhere near as significant. I, 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 think I, I think it's fair to say that most sort of standard volume build houses, you know, are overglazed. You know, hmm. They have too much glass. Um, you know, particularly in the big combined kitchen, living, dining rooms with massive floor to ceiling glass walls that cantilever and fold back, you know, for this indoor outdoor flow. Well, 
you know, that's a very thermally inefficient thing to do. And, you know, it's going to be cold in winter and you're going to get condensation and you can't put furniture up against it. So you've actually got probably another meter and a half of floor area against the big glass floor to ceiling wall because you can't put any furniture within the space that the door's going to fold back and cantilever around. So, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, just in the general public don't really understand the implications. They've, they've seen pictures of big glazed you know surfaces you know indoor outdoor flow and they think oh yeah i want that for that perfect summer's day but they're not thinking about the the, the months of winter and you know how that's going to be really uncomfortable so i think that's that's something we want to really i guess highlight is that the practical consequences of those um you know desired aesthetics um you can be really miserable in those rooms we've um been doing a bit of work on a few of our projects now where <clears throat> because of the software we use <clears throat> running um, future climate scenarios just to see what will happen because we'd like to think that all of our houses will still be here in 2050. Um, has anyone else been doing similar things and what have you learned from doing that? I'm happy to share. I just thought I should ask. Michael, did you look at yours for by any chance? I've not done it for a Canberra climate. but I'm, I'm, I'm just opening it, Andy. Um, <laughs> so you have to, you just can't remember the answer. That's fine. Trying, trying to remember. Right. Try, right. Trying to I'll, remember. I'll try buy you some. I'll buy you some yeah, time. Buy me. Buy me some time. Our our rough experience has been that the core based is all through our passive house software. But by roughly speaking, depending on what you define future climate as, so we're either going plus three or plus four degrees, and we can argue all day about whether that's right or wrong. Um, that you pretty much get a tripling of cooling demand. Um, Oh, as in energy used for, for keeping the building within temperature um, com comfort levels. Um, and depending, you normally get um, around about a, a halving of the energy for heating. So it's, it balances out not terribly, to be honest, between the two. Um, but what I've noticed in looking at different projects is it's very, very dependent on the glazing. Um, so um, Chris's house performs exceptionally well because of how it's glazed and how the glazing is orientated because it's very north south, whereas the houses that have got more east and west in them perform less well as the climate gets warmer. Um, so I think the glass area is the is that big factor, especially once it's mm. not north, it's due north or due south. Michael, you had a bit of time to open your Yeah, yeah, yeah. I opened I opened the um the passive house planning package and just um entered the um the 2050 climate data set. Um so I mean, the, num the numbers are relative. So, so currently the heating demand is modelled at 14 kilowatt hours per metre squared per year. And that's, that number won't mean, mean much to, to a lot of people, but that's how much heating is required um, per square metre over the year. So that's currently 14. If I put in the 2050 uh, climate data set, that heating demand drops to eight. So that's what, nearly a 50% reduction. Okay. Um, in terms of the cooling, the cooling demand increases from four kilowatt hours per meter squared per year to nine. So, okay, seems about even one, one, one halves, one doubles. Okay, fair enough. Um, That's pretty good. That's but, but both, both are still within the um, the passive house requirements. Mm. Okay, That's good. Good to Which know. is good, yeah. Sort of. So, yeah. I mean, I think as as you touched on, I think it, that's probably partly because, or a lot because the um, the window area in my house is is relatively low. Yeah. So if if there was a lot more glazing, then obviously that would, no doubt, um, the heating, the heating demand would um. No, hang on, I'm confusing myself now. I'll let you regain regather your thoughts. We'll come back to that. Excel spreadsheets can do that for all of it them. It is. There's so many numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and that PHPP is worse. It's, oh, God. Um, we've got a couple of questions. There's been some around louvers, about the use of louvers mm -hmm. in buildings. Um, would anybody like to chirp in on their views upon the use of those? 
I would say uh, we we discussed it with my mum because she she grew up in Queensland and she loved the idea of louvers being in the house. And Brian it sort of comes back to what Brian was talking about with ceiling. I think it depends on where you are. Um, it's probably going to impact passive house in a big way using louvered windows. Um, but yeah, definitely a climate dependent thing um, because I haven't found a product yet that seals well when a louvered window is in its closed position. Um, and also, you know, I've not found a good, I've seen some uh, advertised double glazed louvered windows, but I haven't been, been game enough to use one. Um, so, yeah, it, it's very dependent on where you use them, I think. Um, and, yeah, in the cooler climates, they're, they're, they're fraught with danger. Yep, that's, that, that would be my sort of view too. We did once use a double glazed louvered unit on a commercial project many, many years ago. Um, and it works quite well and they sealed okay. Um, our, the, the practical challenge was the reason people seem to love the louvers is because they're so transparent, but because of the nature of the double glazing, you've got, they've all got a, their own little frame. So all you've really got is a big panel of lots of rectangular windows. So you kind of, it performed the job it needed to in a commercial building, but it was not the thing that people think of when they think of louvers. So I think the, the aesthetics were challenging in that, on that front. I, I think they have a place like there's a lot of us in this room and we're, we're biased because we're passive house and we're, we're rabbits in the hole already. And um, I will say that I've been in a few houses in Fremantle area, like old limestone cottages. And if it wasn't for louvers, they'd be in a world of hurt. Like that's the reality. Like we talk about the Fremantle doctor here and the breeze that comes through and it does. It's like clockwork during the summer it comes in. Like once you get above 35 degrees, it starts to taper off and we lose it when you most need it. But we're aware of that. But for the majority of the shoulder seasons and that, that breeze comes in and it's, yeah, for the older houses, it works. I have to put my hand up and say it works. And I'm an advocate for passive house, but I think louvers have a place. And if, if they're put in the correct way and you get cross flow ventilation correctly, they can be a lifesaver. Mm. They really can. Like and it was interesting also when Michael was bringing up the, um, you know, passive designed houses for passive solar and, and passive cross flow ventilation. That if those designs are thought through, you know, if if passive ha passive house, the certified system, isn't quite within a person's, uh, you know, budget potentially, um, you know, if you can analyze the microclimate on a on a site well and as well as possible, you might be able to get the things like louvers working quite well, as you say. I think it illustrates the point that it it comes down to the design and design. Mm should yep. be at least and maybe it isn't always should be site specific mm. and you know there's systems that work and but they're not always going to be the right system so horses for courses mm. yeah andy i've just seen someone someone's commented in the chat about um apparently I'm, I'm referring to the sydney sydney climate as being mild but obviously in the west now penrith way towards the mountains and richmond it is mm not anywhere near so mild in summer no it is it much is, it's very different yes it's much closer to your climate mm. on than oh, it's in summer more so I, I suspect yes yeah so so, so yeah when, when i talk about climate i'm probably thinking of the city and the near near the coast yeah um but yeah obviously obviously richmond and penrith is very very different um so I've just wrapped my head around the, the PHPP and, and obviously more windows, more windows results in um, more cooling demand and more risk of overheating in uh, 2050 if the climate continues to warm. So, so that's probably a, um, it's probably another, another uh, uh, warning for, for people building new houses now to, to be conscious of how much glazing they have going forward. As it's not, it's not getting any colder. I think I think most mm. of us would agree. Yeah, on this web I, webinar. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I would also say, you know, the uncomfortable hot days in Tassie are, are starting to increase, but I think it's mm. still still hovering at around six uncomfortable hot days a year. Um, and yeah, even despite the um, the west facing windows, I will say that because of that, um, we, we looked at the prevailing winds and the diurnal shift that we get in in that particular part of. Um, Hobart and yeah during the summer um, even before the blinds were in when we got the cross flow ventilation when we had the windows on either side opened up um, when it was too hot we could cool it in you know a minute a minute flat um, so that room 
that that was the hardest hit by by the massive windows we're able to control that quite well so we have no no active cooling in in the building at all that's pretty impressive um there's a couple of questions looking asking around which is it's verging into passive house land but that's probably inevitable um asking about issues with overheating um in summer um chris um do you want to talk i know you, you know a lot about all of these things i the yeah, I mean, I'm personally, I'm not worried about this building overheating in summer in that we've got uh, the horizontal external shading providing good solar control. The sun's not going to hit the glass when you've got the high angle hot summer sun. So we've, we've controlled our solar gains outside the thermal envelope. And then for heat waves, we do have an air conditioner in this house. So we can cool it if necessary, but um, you know, with those external blinds on the two west facing windows and the fixed external shading on the northern elevation, I'm not particularly concerned about overheating. We've got ceiling fans in, in every room. We've got huge openable areas of the windows. So you know, to the extent it's a hot day and there is a breeze, we can avail ourselves of that and use the ceiling fans for a natural cooling strategy. And then if it gets super hot as it sometimes does in sydney and you have a 42 degree day then that's what's great about passive house you can close all the windows and you can turn the air conditioner on you've still got fresh air from the ventilation system and you've got really efficient cooling so um yeah i'm kind of looking forward to summer actually to see how that all works not at all surprised by that um brian you've obviously built quite a few of these high performance houses and mm -hmm. perth's climate has some similarities to sydney's according to the data at least yep. um have you had many issues with overheating i was so, aware that one of the earlier houses which i don't think was one of yours um the clients felt they had issues with overheating yeah um, so it, it can be an issue like and anyone that says it's not is they're either telling lies or they're making it up it can be an issue especially when you get a prolonged period of time where you do not get cooling at night so if you can't flush ventilate the house or if you don't have a means of cooling the house at night when it stays at 30 degrees which happens in perth and it can happen for more than two weeks at, at times so it can get to 40 42 degrees during the day even higher and only get to 30 degrees at night so then you have no opportunity to cool that house down so even with a passive house you're phasing during the day of your energy transfer through to the building. That's going to happen. That's going to happen every and every year. You're consistent one mission to percent. So you're always going to slightly climb, always. You're never going to have a perfect exchange rate. So can you guys still hear me, yeah? You went a bit funny on me. But... Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you can, good. Yeah, okay. So look, the proof is in the pudding. So what we've done is if we've got six data loggers, okay? And we put the data log, we put a data logger in each house in an area that's inconspicuous. So it sits in the corner and every eight hours, it takes humidity level, temperature, and uh, um, oh, what was the third one? I can't remember. There's a third one, but it takes those. And then it, we leave it in there for four, four seasons for one calendar year and we take it out and we test it. And then... In not all the houses, but in the passive houses, the, the certified passive houses, we then put um, a kilowatt hour meter on the air conditioning only, right? So we know exactly what the heating and cooling is because in a passive house, it's a split system. That's what we use. So on two-story house, we usually have two, one upstairs, one downstairs. But again, that depends on the design. So when you sit down and you look at the design and you look at how it's laid out and you look at it and you think, look, this is Northwest master suite it's going to overheat we need to have an air conditioner in here or we need to have it close to it so that this person that lives in this house has a facility to cool his room down if he needs but just getting back to your question if you guys look on the sustainable house day website and look up the certified passive house in north beach okay there's a house in north beach the owner is called carlos he was the first guy we built a house for the first certified house we built it's a certified passive house plus just listen to what he says he gives you that answer because we did the data loggers and we did the kilowatt hour meters on his air conditioners. And his house has temperature data for a calendar year. It never goes below 18. It never goes above 25. And you have data to show how many kilowatt hours we've used for heating and cooling. 
I'm also not surprised that someone who was an early adopter of Passive House was a data nerd. That seems to be quite a theme as well in that little neck of the woods. <laughs> he's um, an engineer. <laughs> he's a lot of those. Um, yeah. really good clients. He's um, an absolute legend. This guy is incredible. He's incredible. Listen, listen to what he says. He, he's real down to earth. It's 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 a video worth watching. I haven't seen it. I will check it out. Um, I have been somewhat remiss in my MCing duties. I was a little bit um, over enthused about the questions, and I have failed to notice the time. We are approaching the end, and rather than go to one last question, what I thought I may do is give everyone a moment if they wish to um, throw any last minute uh, from the panel. That is to throw in any last minute thoughts um, that they'd like to put on the table. Answer a question they saw in the chat or just make a broad brush statement about whatever they feel like, really. It's your floor for not too long each. Thank you very much. Um, in whatever order you decide to fight it out over. <laughs> just a huge thank you to Sustainable House Day and Renew. It's incredible. The effort these guys go to, what they're able to push out over the, like three or four weeks, it's incredible. Thank you. That's all I can say. I'll have a go. I mean, we're just super happy with the tilt and turn, passive house, double glazed, you know, thermally broken windows that we've got. Um, you know, it's just so markedly different from the previous 1950s house that we lived in that was here prior, you know, condensation and mould uh, in winter and overheating in summer. So, um, you know, they're well worth the investment. And, um, you know, we've, we've got, um, you know, lots of lovely experiences from winter and you know as i said looking forward to summer i think they perform beautifully when did you move in chris how long have you been in june there? june okay so we've we've been in since april and um you know canberra is a bit more is a bit colder than than, than sydney obviously but but winter here in canberra has been has been pretty pretty cruisy in the in the passive house um the most noticeable difference i think uh living in a passive house with triple glazed windows is the uh, the quietness. It's almost, it's arguably almost too quiet. So while all the external noise is, most of it is cut out, sometimes that's a little bit of background or white noise. So inside the house, if there's noise, if someone's making noise, you can hear that. So I think if I, if I had my time again, I'd try and build in a bit more a bit more um, softness and more, some more acoustically absorbent materials in the walls, ceilings, floors, just to counteract that quietness. <clears throat> or different shapes, different angled ceilings or angled walls. Our house is all quite, quite rectilinear and boxy and we've got a concrete floor and plasterboard carpets only in a couple of the bedrooms. Um, so that's, there's a pl plus and a minus there, but it's certainly been peaceful compared to where we were living before well, that's a nice thought to leave it on because that's got an incredible depth of things to go off and think about um daniel oh um yeah i'll just say you know um we touched on it you know there's different climates all across australia um you know so if you're in a cooler climate you know i think um passive house uh, the passive house certification system and, and passive house certified design is a great thing to to um to look into um and then if you're getting into the hotter parts of australia um you know still passive house can absolutely work for for you um if you've you know you're in a really built up area it's a really great system to to consider um but you know the guys up in the top top far north of australia you know are doing amazing stuff like the guys at tropo you know they've got really really open houses um, and they just say you know have massive amounts of roof so you can shade the hell out of your house and have cross flow ventilation and that should take care of the heat um so i guess yeah talk to your professionals talk about what your budget is talk about what you want to achieve um because yeah there's heaps of people who are really interested in sustainability will love to talk through the different options that are open to you so and i think that's what's really fantastic about sustainable house days that you see so many different um executions of of sustainable houses so yeah keep talking to your professionals thank you very much indeed daniel thanks to everyone on our panel this evening um, i've had a lovely time i hope those who've been tuning in have as well um, if you have let us know if you haven't let us know too um, i'd like to particularly extend the thanks to everyone at renewed for sustainable house day um, as um, as Brian has done a very good job of, uh, of saying, like that it's a it's a fantastic event. 
uh, truly wonderful. Glad you're all supporting it. Keep supporting it. Um, the world needs more things like this. I would also like to briefly revisit something that Brian mentioned right at the start, which is the Your Home Technical Manual. Um, as of about a week and a half ago, the update to that was released. It was a reasonably significant update. It's been in the works for actually a couple of years. Um, it's still free. It's on the website. You can still you can now buy hard copies if you want hard copies. Um, all of the things that we've been talking about, whether it be Windows or the Passive House bit or anything that we're newer talking about in terms of sustainable design and sustainable homes is in the Your Home Technical Manual. It's government. It is completely unbiased because it's government um, and therefore it's an incredible resource. Um, so please do embrace that. Thank you again to Renew. Thank you to you all for um, being with us this evening. And Maddie, to you, I believe. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you again to everyone. Thank you in particular to the more than 300 people who have stuck with us for the entire two hours. Um, every single one of you deserves some kind of medal for your pursuit of higher learning. Um, I just want to very quickly uh, end us out with um, mentioning that we have more expert sessions coming up. Um, next week is our Building for Climate Resilience Week, which based on some of the comments and questions um, may be of interest to quite a few of you. And then on 7th October, sorry, 17 October, we have a free day of online sessions um, as part of our Sustainable House Day, as well as tours for more than 130 houses. They are really, really beautiful. A lot of those are up already on our website at sustainablehousedate.com. I definitely recommend checking them out. And we'd like to thank our sponsors and council partners for making Sustainable House Day possible. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>